So hello everyone, my name is Dalton Grimes. I am one of the L2s from the Fort Wayne Dynasty. Um, so, <laughs> so John went ahead and covered a lot of gameplay errors and a lot that you need to know for competitive REL. I'm going to focus on some of the other sides of that, which are the tournament errors. So a lot of what we do when we study and practice to become a judge is we go over the rules and we want to make sure that we know how cards interact with each other. And pretty much whenever you have a problem with cards interacting with each other, that falls under a gameplay error. Um, when you start making issues as a player, or when you come up to a table as a judge to help fix those issues, uh, that may fall under a tournament error. So we have nine different instances of those, which I'm going to talk about. Um, two, not so much. Um, the first one is tardiness. And depending on the event you're at, um, it may fall at zero minutes as a game loss, three minutes as a game loss, one minute as a game loss, uh, ten minutes as the match loss, though. Um, I'm not going to focus on that one a whole lot. You also have insufficient shuffling, which could be you search your library and just smash them together and call it done. That could be insufficient shuffling, and those are not as prevalent as some of the others I'm going to talk about. So outside assistance comes when a person offers or you ask for assistance, a player asks for assistance uh, with how to play their match. Uh, slow play occurs when a player is intentionally playing at a very slow pace in order to possibly draw out the match time or to maybe gain an advantage. Yes? Is that slow play or That's stalling? That's also stalling. Okay. Yeah. Slow play could just be them analyzing the situation and trying to take forever to get in all possible information. And that, yeah, slow play tends to lead to stalling investigations. Hmm. You have deckless problem, which I tend to remember as if a deck is what they mean to play, then the issue probably falls under deck list problem. You have deck problem, whereas if the deck list is what they intend to play, it usually falls under a deck problem. You have limited procedure violations, so problems with drafting or deck construction. You have communication policy violations, which falls under anything covered in section four of the MTR. And then marked cards is the last one that I will go over. So what I have here are a bunch of scenarios that I'm going to need your help to work through. So our first one, uh, during a competitive REL draft, Adelise passes pack three to Bear and says, Hey man, I can't use this, but I know you'll love the card on top there. When allowed to, Baird flips over the card and reveals a Teferi Hero of Dominaria. So what do we do? I will ask Shane. What do you think we're looking at? Um, not had this come up before. Uh, yeah? All right. So I'm going to go with process. limited procedure violation. Sure. Yeah, so we're in a portion of a tournament that involves limited play. So chances are we're probably looking at limited procedure error. Right. For who? Uh, no. Uh, no. Adelaide? Adelaide. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so I picked plenty of fantastic names throughout the history of magic. <laughs> So Adelise passes the pack and says, hey, you might be able to use this. So sure, it makes sense that Adelise might be getting a, a possible error there. Um, what about Baird? Has Baird done anything wrong in this situation? Uh, no. 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 Baird has simply been drafting the cards. So we have an infraction here. Uh, but I want to look at outside assistance, actually. So, uh, quoted from the MTR, players and spectators will refrain from providing any information about draft selections and strategies between the bot announcement and the end of draft. Um, taking that MTR and moving down to the booster draft procedures, you say it says players are not permitted to reveal hidden information of any kind to other participants in the draft regarding their own picks or what they want others to pick. So I agree. When you look at this situation, it looks a lot like it's going to be limited procedure error because we are in the limited portion of the tournament. But because one player is offering outside assistance, and maybe that wasn't their intention. The player could have very well been like, man, this card's worth $50, and I can't use it because I'm trying to win. It doesn't mean that they have to be trying to provide a competitive advantage, but the fact that they are creates an issue. So, in this case, Adelise receives a match loss. Yes, David? Well, I, I was just going to ask, um, you know, with, with outside assistance, it requires that the player be 
getting some strategic advice. And uh, would, would you consider the uh, the remark that was made by a player here to be of a strategic character in this situation? I would, because it's a good card. Yeah. It is something that you can use in your deck to provide a better advantage. So, but you can also. Wouldn't that imply then that Adelie would know what Bard is playing? It could. You can gather that information, or at least assume that information during your draft. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so you may not be right. No, you could be totally wrong. And they could have just been like, ha ha, here's this money card. Mm -hmm. Good for you. Yeah, so how would you feel if I walked up to your table, you're playing a match, and say, hey, Holly, you should cast that lightning bolt on their guy? I mean, that, in that case. They can see it could be hand. a very bad play, right? It could be something that doesn't actually provide strategical advantage. But it is letting your opponent know what's in your hand. But I'm still trying to give assistance. Correct. Okay. So since we are in the limited portion of the tournament, you can't assess a match loss during your draft. Like, you know, they can't lose the draft. Um, so that is applied at the first <laughs> instance possible. And Baird receives no penalty. Jane, I want you to pick someone. Uh, Who's going next? <laughs> Not David. Okay. <laughs> um, who's not had a turn? Renee. Renee, fantastic. All right, so Renee, we are at a PPTQ, and Anax moves to combat on his turn, asking his opponent, how many blockers do you have available? Uh, his opponent, Najila, says four. So Anax attacks with all five of his creatures and says, you can't block one, I win. You're at one life. Okay. In the clear blocker step, Najila says, oh, crap. I forgot about this dryad armor. I actually have five. I'll block all your creatures. Um, Anax isn't very happy about this. Calls for a judge. Uh, when you investigate, you determine that Najila truly did forget about the Dryad Arbor. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> okay. Yep. Correct player shouldn't have forgotten. But just because a player shouldn't have, does that mean they never do? No. <laughs> okay, so what does that fall under now? <laughs> yes, so uh, to help you out there, with the new update to the communication policies, uh, it outlines the entirety of section four for the MTR. And one of those rules states that now, um, non-land permanents must be displayed closer to your opponent than lands, um, is one of the changes that has been stated. It also states that creatures that are associated with, say, mana abilities or maybe artifacts that can tap for mana are okay to keep with lands when being used for mana, um, but must remain distinctly separate. So, so i.e. like a man like that. Yeah. More precisely. Yes. So creatures can never be your landmine. Yes. Like artif artif non creature permanents that can they're mostly just there to tap for mana can be your landmine. So like if you have, let's say, a mana lift, that can be your landmine. That's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm just using something that's very simple. Mana lift can be your landmine. Or a moss, whatever. Those can be your landmine. If it's ever so, yes, a non creature. Landmine. Yes. If it's a creature, it has to be a front. Mm -hmm. so, Period. No so, question asked. A dryad arbor under a blood moon could be in with the lands until the blood moon is removed. No. 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 Dryad arbor is a creature. Yeah. Blood moon. It blood moon interacts, interacts in a different. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, it remains its. It retains its creatureness in a blood moon. <laughs> it's so a creature. It retain the artifact trait. Hmm? Just like it would retain the artifact trait if it were a. <clears throat> like a dark steel. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that remains a creature, and that has to be kept with the lands. So we've discovered one problem here. Um, what else is an issue? And this could be to anyone. Well, um, even under the old policy, uh, mm -hmm. this would have been uh, a CPP. Sure. Because uh, one player asked for derived information, one opponent uh, the opponent provided incorrect derived information, uh, and then the uh, uh, the yeah that first player acted on that. Yeah. So um, in this situation, uh, a player. Now, with derived information, you never have to offer that information to your opponent. 
Um, if an opponent asks you a question, you can deny the answer. However, should you choose to provide an answer, it must be correct. Um, in this case, what was stated was incorrect. Um, so looking at our policy uh, in the IPG, a uh, player violates the communication policies detailed in Section 4 of the MTR, and the judge believes that the opponent has acted on the erroneous information. This infraction only applies to violations of that policy and not to general communication confusion. So a backup may be considered to the point of the action and not the erroneous communication. So in this is instance, how do we fix this issue, John? We, we have acted under false information. So we go point, uh, back to the point of the... Uh, the air, uh, the point where they acted on the erroneous information Correct. when they attacked. Yes. Yeah, so in this case, you would want to rewind the game state to the point where that information was acted upon. So regardless of what point in time the player asked for the information, um, you only back up to the point where they did something. So say on the end step, I asked, how many, how many blockers do you have available? If they say four then, we don't have to back up all the way to that end step to do something. We would only back up to the point where they attacked with that information because that is the first thing that they may have done when acting upon it. So, question. Yeah. So would you back it up to the start of combat or would you back it up to the declare attacker step? I like that. So Najilo receives a warning for communication policy violation. That's a given, right? So um, down here, I like, I, I agree. So we arrived to the point where Amax acted under false information. Is it possible that maybe he had a lightning bolt that he could have killed a blocker with? Or I guess we said the player was at one life. So is it possible they could have had like a magma spray that they could have killed a blocker with? Yeah, that's something I would like to talk to the player about because maybe that was part of their acting under false information they could have chosen in the beginning of combat step to do something about it. They could have removed a blocker. Um, but if attackers is the first part of the game where they acted, then that's where you would go to. So I would talk to the player in this case and figure out where they would have acted with that correct information. Yes? So if they instead had an earthquake for one that they would have to play during the first main phase, mm -hmm. would we allow them to back up to that point where they would play that to remove that additional blocker and maybe other blockers. What do you think? Um, I think if the thought is in their head that they maybe need to play this, but they mistakenly ask during prior to declare attackers, that's kind of a kind of a gray area. But I think yes. they, there is a chance that maybe they have made that decision based on, okay, I look down. I see a bunch of two twos. I'm still getting in for the ne lethal amount of damage. Uh -huh. If given the opportunity to play this because I now realize or you have told me, oh, by the way, I also have this random one one sitting here. Yes. I've, I've kind of made an erroneous decision based yeah, on. Yeah, it's that, not so. that you've acted, it's that you chose not to act right. under false information. And I agree, that's a very gray area that you are looking at. Um, so I would recommend in that case discussing with the player what their options would have been should they have known about the information. Right. Because as the IPG states, we back up to the point where they acted. How do you interpret that? Do, do we take the lack of acting as an action or not? Um, if that's the instance, if they would have liked to have rolling thunder for one to remove a blocker, personally that's where I would back up to is that point where they have the opportunity to take an action for it. But not, not taking an action, like in this case of passing priority on the stack, looks like taking a no action. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it, it's a strategic no action. Yes. So right. I, like, I, I would like backing up to the point where they could cast that. They could cast it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just because that way they have all the information. If they chose not to do it, they chose not to do it. But if they would have gone and done it because, hey, wait a minute. Correct. This benefits me. So. Yeah, and at that point, you're also not providing information. So you know, if you can see their hand, and you can see that maybe they would have cast a rolling thunder for one, or they could have, and maybe that would be the strategic play, but they haven't brought that up to you. You don't want to rewind to that point before then, because maybe that hasn't crossed their sure. mind yet. 
in most cases, I, I'm working from the assumption that the player has called over and said, hey, wait a minute, mm -hmm. if I'd have known this loss was here, I would have played this card. Correct. Specifically, point, hey, I would have played this card. Exactly. So, yeah, I would like to talk to them and figure out where. So, fantastic. Good job. So, day two of a Grand Prix. Um, <coughs> I'm familiar, this is that professional, but you don't draft day one. So, no, it's certainly not that. <laughs> We're bringing so, back the draft tokens. <laughs> oh, yeah. No. <laughs> no, please no. No, man. The experienced know. people know what I'm talking about. I, I, I don't, wanna, I don't want to imagine. In that play, in that case, let's bring back day two Rochester too. Two so headed giant <laughs> GP. No. So day two, so players are instructed to open pack one. Athreos opens his pack, picks his card before time's announced, and sets it down in his pile. Doesn't look back. Uh, receiving his second pack, he picks up a card. Picks up the pack, looks at it before time is announced, takes the card, and sets it next to his first pick. With about 10 seconds left, he picks that card up, puts another one in his pile, and passes the pack. Brandon. So, the first one, I believe, uh, is the procedure error. Okay. What do you mean the first one? Uh, opening the pack and taking a card before the time is announced. Sorry, so open the pack when time was announced. Oh. Oh. Um, but before the you know before they say anything, he takes the card. Yeah. Right. In the allotted time. Yes, within the allotted time. Okay. I know some players will wait till the end of time to be announced to pick their card. I'm just saying before <coughs> that. Okay, so he opened uh, the pack. Uh, Set it in the pile, time was announced, pass the pack. Second pack, picks it up, sets a card next to his first pick, changes his mind, puts it on top of his pile, passes. Uh, I believe at that point, uh, there is no issue with him with his second pick, okay. because he did not put that with this uh, pile uh, that he's already taken before. Sure. Uh, since both are separate, uh, if he didn't make the final choice, Okay. So, so what happens if it's the first card? If it's he, go, he goes here, pass pack before time is told. Says, oh my, I should have taken this instead. Takes <laughs> the pack back up, picks the only card in his stack up, and replaces it with a different card. That's a much different case. <laughs> but um, yeah, that that does end in a lot of issues there. Because I've noticed sometimes when people will draft, they will, especially newer players. They will separate stacks based on, hey, I can play this, hey, I can't play this. Like, for mm -hmm. instance, in the money money card example of, hey, look, here's the Teferi, when I clearly want to play this red-green card that was my first pick, yep. but I take the money card and set it here, they are designating, they have taken two cards, one of which is in a playable <coughs> file, one of which is not a sure. playable file, but you as an official might not necessarily know that. That's something that, yeah, as that players will do. And... Is that considered a taken card? Is that not considered a taken card? That is that considered hurt? all wrong. <laughs> yep. So, back to our example. Does anyone agree or disagree with Brandon? Uh, Brandon has said, no problem here. They didn't put it in their stack. Good? Cool. So, Nylea called the judge. And our MTR states that once players removed a card from the pack and put it on top of his or her single Front face down drafted pile, it is considered selected and it may not be returned to the pack. So in your case, um, if they have put it in their pile, they have messed up and have no option. Well, if, if they take it back and switch it out, you are looking at a limited procedure error. IPG 3.6, or sorry, limited procedure violation. I'll use the correct uh, wording here. Um, IPG gives examples. Uh, in examples, it says a player puts a card on top of their draft pile, then pulls it back. So, yeah, I would say this falls under that. Um, in the case of my example, this does not fall under that. And I would agree with you, Brandon. There's no infraction here. Athreos has selected a card. Um, they didn't put it in their single face down draft pile, have not added it to their picks, and have broken no rules of magic. I would say this would be no different than they have their cards. They have one in hand here, the, all the others here. Wait, 
and then go, oh, no, bam. I like no penalty. At a modern SCG Invitational Qualifier, Adamaro has been playing Magic for a while, but only ever at home with his friends. A few of his buddies wanted to participate in the tournament, so he signed up as well. Adamaro is on the play, he plays an island, and passed his turn. His opponent plays a mountain, casts Lava Spike. Since Adamaro ain't no scrub, he casts Blue Elemental Blast. <laughs> his opponent calls for a judge. <laughs> so first, yes, round of applause for Adamaro. That is incredibly ballsy. But what do we do? Daniel. As judge Yes, yeah. Opponent very quickly okay. calls for a judge. All right. Because you have all three. So our problem here is that our players cast Blue Elemental Blast in Modern. <laughs> Correct. I would agree with that. Do you have that available? I do. Would you like to consult it? Okay. Fantastic. What do you think in the meantime? Same thing after consult the after group. Okay. Way. Well, I mean, clearly the card's not legal in the format. Yeah. Like, uh, without checking, I'd probably have well, the judge would deck check and take all copies of the illegal cards out and place them on the base deck. Fantastic. So we know that we're going to take the deck and alter the deck list, right? Yeah. So what do you think we fall into? What do you mean? What do you we are changing a deck list. That actually depends. Mm -hmm. Depends on if the uh, Blue Elemental Blasts are actually listed on his deck list. You consult the deck list and they are. Then we have. <laughs> Wait, then, good. then we've got a deck error. Oh, that's a deck, deck error. error? Or a deck you know, you know why, yeah. right? Yes. <laughs> yes. That has come up before. Well, Daniel, have you figured it out? Or two fled to one of those two cards is legal and proper, and one is not. <laughs> <laughs> that hurts. So, so yes, there's a difference in those two cards in one particular format. <laughs> I can see it. I've never had that come up. I'm actually, I'm thinking deck problem, yeah. Okay. Any reason why? Um, well, no. Actually, no. That That's just my natural tendency. Yeah. I, I, yeah. The deck and the deck list problems are very difficult to discern between each other. Um, so here in the IPG under decklist problems, we receive the statement, the decklist is illegal, doesn't match what the player intended to play, or needs to be modified due to a card loss over the course of the tournament. In this case, our player is a genius and has played Blue Elemental Blast in his modern deck. Um, that would mean that our decklist is illegal. We do not have an appropriate deck based upon the format. So this will fall under deck list problems. Um, what's the penalty? Huh? Game loss. It is a game loss. Yeah. So um, you remove all copies of all illegal cards from Adamaro's deck. Just because we're looking for blue elemental blast doesn't mean they might have made a mistake elsewhere. Um, and for a deck list problem, you are allowed to replace any number of cards, if your deck falls below 60 from removing the cards, you may name, you may replace those with any number of cards labeled Island, Mountain, Swamp, Plains, or Forest. After the deck list has been accounted, uh, you make changes in that, and Adamaro will choose whether to play or draw in the next game. Sideboards may not be used. Uh, yeah. 
In game one? Because they haven't played a game of Magic. Someone played did a bolt. Someone got the blue metal blast. Yeah, they, they found that out in the middle of the game. <laughs> they did? So that, that was what you said, right? I, well, I did, yes. <laughs> that, that changes it? Oh, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Where? Okay. That changes they played so Magic. You get to you can't play sideboards if you have started playing a game of Magic. Okay. Yeah. Got it. That's, that's, that's most common with uh, beginning of round deck checks. Okay. So there we go. For a deck check at the beginning of the round, a uh, player gets to choose whether to play or draw. Uh, in this case, who gets to choose whether to play or draw? Or, sorry. <laughs> With a deck check game loss, sideboards may not be used. Uh, in this case, because they have seen magic be played, um, no matter how poorly it is, you're allowed to use sideboards. Thank you. Next one. <laughs> a limited PPTQ. During deck construction, Adriana's working on her pool, staring at her cards. She says, man, I'm at 26. What do I cut? <laughs> Nekusar, sitting right next to her, says, yo, Grixis is where it's at. You should probably cut those white cards. Destroying enchantments is overrated. <laughs> uh, since this is Adriana's first tournament, she didn't know to call a judge, but you happened to be, and ignored it, you happened to be walking by standing right behind her. <clears throat> Holly. Uh, I mean, it is outside assistance, and definitely Nekusar gets outside assistance for offering outside assistance. Since it is competitive, then I would assume Adriana also gets outside assistance, and they both get match loss. Okay. So we say match loss for both, as Adriana is <laughs> seeking outside assistance, and Nekusar provides it. Mm. Any other agreements, disagreements? Steven? <laughs> well, it's more she didn't call a judge, <coughs> okay. not that she solicited specifically, but she did speak out loud. Yes. So, yeah. I see, yeah. Talking out loud. Don't mind me. Okay. <laughs> Daniel. So both players have received a match loss, but are playing against each other. The next round opponent gets giddy because he's just advanced one slot further without having to play. Um, if I'm not mistaken, then penalties can offset, right? I don't think match loss can, but game losses can. Well, also, they game shouldn't be paired game. against yeah, each match. other. Should we're actually be working properly? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> what also is is saying out loud, I need to cut two cards because I have twenty six. Period. Is that asking for outside assistance as opposed to I need to cut two cards because I'm at twenty six? What should I cut? Well, really, they should cut twenty three cards to go to twenty three. <laughs> That's correct. But some people will play twenty four, sixteen, oh, forty three. <laughs> so. We have a lot of issues with this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay, there's also another fun one. It's Adriana's first tournament. Does she know she was supposed to report something? No. So she that's a very important thing to mention or not. Because at that point, she could have, I don't know, gained an advantage, know she was breaking a rule. That's something slightly different. That's that's right. Yeah, that, <laughs> that very well could be. No, I, I would say that that doesn't affect what you can practice <laughs> Does but it? It, but it does lead to a cheating investigation. That's that's no, like that overrides the other my, my 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 point being is that doesn't necessarily change uh, uh, the situation that we have here. My point being is is that if we're looking for an infraction here, regardless of it being cheating or not, we can find the infraction and then work from there. Steven. Uh, this is what we were discussing back here. Uh, does anybody know how to put a double match loss on two words without getting <laughs> if the answer is no, the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. No, it's all right. How can you burp me? Yes, you can't help. No, that's that's only IPG, NPR, and CR. Yeah. I haven't had to put a match loss period into words, so I would probably ask somebody else. <laughs> but they say they do say they have a lot in there on IPG. 
match also applies during a match during which the offense has occurred, unless the match has already ended. So, after match of A, one of these matches have already ended, so the other match should also apply to the next match. <laughs> so, so you win one and then lose the next? I, I don't and the other want, I don't want that topic. Point. I don't want that happening. No, that I don't like this. So, anyway, we all know that we have problems here. <clears throat> Judge Judy can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the MTR for outside assistance, like I stated earlier, during deck construction, players and spectators may not provide any advice or commentary to a player until that player's deck list has been handed in. We know that hers has not, so we know that we fall under this. Um, IPG 3.2, outside assistance, a player, spectator, or other tournament participant does any of the following, um, such as seeks play advice or hidden information about their match from others once they have sat for their match, and states that these criteria also apply to any deck construction or draft portions of a limited tournament. So, um, in this scenario, I was imagining you have Nekusar here, Adriana here, she says, man, I'm at 26, what do I cut? Looking at her own card pool, focused in. Nekusar pops in, says, yo, blah, 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 cut white, it's stupid. And you just happen to be right there behind them. You stop. So, so you stop them here. Um, we're going to assume that Adriana didn't like immediately call a judge, but you're there at the situation to stop it. Okay? So what do we think? You, you said Nekusar receives... Nekasar, I would say, definitely gets an outside assistant. Okay. If you're standing right there and you're intervening, mm -hmm. like, hold up, you, then at that point, I would I would think she's probably in the clear, but maybe make sure she knows to call a judge in the future. Okay. Sure. Anyone agree or disagree? Uh, she didn't seek advice. He gave advice. Sure. So she couldn't get a warning. Okay. Is there a chance you maybe pause for another few seconds to see how she reacts to what he said? Because again, if she's honed in and focused on her cards, mm -hmm. she may be so focused. And if she, she knows you are that. there, she might not even bother calling because she knows you're there and you've not stopped her. Mm -hmm. And she's not reacting to what he has said. So, yeah. So in this case, um, I would believe that Adriana receives no penalty. Um, you're not going to wait and see how she responds. Um, you don't want to provide that opportunity. And I, I know it's tempting to say, okay, let's let's test this player. Let's see what's happening here. Right. Um, we don't want to do that to our players. Um, if I'm playing Holly, and I go to Holly and I go, hey, I'm, I'm going to slip you this $10 bill for this match result. Um, before Holly can even call a judge, you're standing right there behind me. Do you give her the chance to say anything? Or do you just immediately jump in? I mean, yeah, you're probably right. So yeah, that's a case where you immediately step in. You don't even give Holly the chance to say yes or no. You just go, hey, out of here. Um, I believe this falls under the same case. You don't want to provide a player. We don't need to test the, you know, the morality. honor, the morality of our players. We just want to stop it from happening. But giving play advice is slightly different than bribery, too. It is, yes. That is, that is true. Mind you, you should also remind, remind Adriana, you're not supposed to talk while building your deck, even to yourself. Yeah, there's... Yes. No. <laughs> like, that's, that's, that's something completely separate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and then Nekusar receives a match loss. I agree with that. Um, <laughs> since Adriana was not seeking outside assistance in this case, um, you could tell that she was honed in on herself, she was focused, she may have been talking aloud, which is wrong. <laughs> Shouldn't be done. Um, I wouldn't state that she was explicitly seeking uh, advice. Whereas Nekusar offer that information. Um, even if he thought Adriana was asking him a question. You know, and, and you say, hey, man, you're going to receive this match loss. And he says, oh, well, she asked for it. Well, it doesn't matter. You still gave it. And so that's a problem. So, mind you, although she said something we should, shouldn't be communicating and did, that's still not a CPP. That's not covered in that section. Correct. Let's yeah. be clear about and that, And you will too. remind her and say, hey, <clears throat> we don't talk during this portion. Um, any of you attending mock tournaments. Um, <laughs> but also you say, also, in the future, please call for a judge as soon as you feel something is wrong. In the finals of a PPTQ, a Johnny says to Nahiri, hey, I know I'm not going to this RPTQ. How about you give me 18 of your packs and you can have the win? 
The original payouts for the event stated that first place would get 24 packs and the RPCQ invite in second place would get 18 packs. Scott. Is this another scenario where you're right there overhearing it? Or, or I mean, it's the finals. It's all the tournaments. Yeah, it's the finals. Yeah. So you're probably sitting there. <laughs> that's that's way to cool. state it. I mean, he was yeah. accurate. That's He's the not playing in the RPCQ that way. And that's it. <laughs> yeah. No, no, not that one. Anyone agree or disagree? I think the important thing here is quid pro quo. Yeah. Uh, that's the the dividing line. Okay. And would you explain that? Oh, of course, but I, I was going to leave it for you if you would like. Oh, no, go ahead. Uh, so in this case, the, 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 the big dividing line I see is, is this quid pro quo situation, which is, if I do this, you will do this for me. Uh, this being uh, distinctly different from, I, I show up at the table and I say, hey, uh, do you want to split it so that um, the, the winner gets the invite and the loser gets all the packs? Um, yeah, that works fine. But the moment we go for... I will do this so that you do this. It is bad. Yeah. Does it change in this case? Aaron says to Nessie, hey, I know I'm not going to this RPCQ, but that noble hierarch is really sweet. I need one for my green white value town deck. How about you give me the noble hierarch when you go and you can have the win? If it was worded differently, then it'd be okay. But... If it was worded differently, it would be okay? Why is that? Well, in his example, like, it's, if you say, hey, do you want to split instead, yeah. it's okay, as opposed to, give me your packs and I'll give you a win. Steven? Uh, I disagree with this because you were using uh, rewards outside the context of redistributing the price for this included tournament aspect. Sure. How is that? Um, th this is me basically saying, hey, you give me your noble hierarchy. But, but it comes from the PPCQ. You go to the RPCQ and you get it. It counts, right? Right, but again, that's so the difference is... <laughs> not right. Players, players, players can... That's me acknowledging this statement. Players can redistribute the prize pool, and that's all they can do. They cannot say, like, uh, I'll, I'll buy you a pot if you can split. Yeah. Or, you know, yeah. I will... In, in the future date, I will trade you this for this. They can introduce outside elements. Right. That's the thing. That's what I'm looking for. The, the key difference is so there's 1,800 in prizes between first and second. They go, I would like to redistribute prizes where we each walk away with 900. That's the code thing. Mm -hmm. uh, saying, give me some of your prize money and I will concede is not. But if you were to go, so prizes for this is 1,800 total between us, you would get 1,200, I would get 600. Um, I would like to discuss the prize split. I would like to say that we each walk away with 900. End statement. Would you like to concede? That is not a deal. Okay. No, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So MTR 5.2 on bribery says it is not bribery when players in the announced last round of the single elimination portion of a tournament agree to a winner and how to divide the subsequent tournament prizes. In that case, one of the players at each table must agree to drop from the event. Players receive the prizes according to the final ranking. So this is what Leon was talking about. Um, you are allowed to talk about how you would like to distribute prizes. You are allowed to talk about, you know, who you're allowed to state that you might want to concede to your opponent or your opponent may state that they might want to concede to you. But as John has mentioned, um, it can't be one for the other. Um, so I do apologize in this first case. Um, I didn't word it properly. I meant to word it um, along the lines of what you were stating. Um, so this next slide won't be quite right. Um, but in the first scenario, neither player would receive an infraction if I had written it um, the way that Lee stated. I was kind of tired, and <laughs> I'd worked 12, 12 hour shifts in a row 
um, it wasn't great. So I apologize for that. Um, but yeah, in the finals of the single elimination portion, players may barter prizes from within the tournament um, alongside match results. Um, in the second scenario, A.A. Rondo messed up. Um, and by correct, stating, I'll give you this card if you concede to me. That is never okay. Um, and we want to squash that behavior as soon as it is there. Um, hopefully you're there in the scenario and can stop it immediately before a double DQ. Uh, not always the case. What happens if there is a double DQ in the finals of an event with an invitation? So, anytime a player is removed, mm -hmm. the people below them move up in rank until they're fine. And then <clears throat> prizes are delineated accordingly. Yeah. Um, if you've already cut, you don't bring people up. Right. So, in, in this case, you. So say that happens in the first round of a final cut to top eight, that two players disqualify for whatever reason. You don't take ninth and tenth place and bring them into seventh and eighth. Okay. Well, but they do get seventh and eighth prizes. They will get seventh and eighth prizes. But let's say players, you know, third and fourth places have already left the venue, and now your first and second ones are leaving the venue with trips to Dairy Queen. Yep. So how do you, do you somehow then try to contact? You could try. Yeah. I would probably talk to the store owner, see if there's anything you can do. Find them on Facebook. Yeah. Maybe. Um, Surprise! You actually won! Easy yeah. enough. Right. You get extra yeah. prizes. <clears throat> you may be able to contact Wizards. I don't know if that's a possibility or not. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, you have their DCI. And you could say, like, hey, these people, blah, blah, blah. Uh, disqualifications, trips to Dairy Queen. Uh, mm -hmm. They should have had prizes. Is there any way you can alert them? Maybe they won't, maybe they won't. In a team constructed open, Akroma, Alicia, and Anafenza are playing against Neheb, Numat, and Nivmazet. I dug so deep for names. <laughs> Akroma and Neheb are the only two playing, and the score of the match is one to one. All players on each team are helping their friends win the final game. Time is tight before the next round, so Numat and Nivmazet go to the bathroom. When they return, they resume their help for Neheb with his game. At this point, Alicia calls for a judge. What do? Well, if they've left the table and not alerted a judge that they need to go make a bathroom trip, then they're not allowed to come back to their seats. Actually, they're not allowed to come back to their seats? Right. And, and Actually, they're, they're, they're not allowed to come back at all. They're not allowed to come back at all? Why do yeah. you say that? Because once you've gotten up and walked away from the match, you have left the play area. Sure. And you can no longer, re you can't return to provide support for your but you teammates. Can't get you can be a spectator, right. but you can't involve yourself in the match. That's true. Yeah. So we're a little short on time, and I won't go as uh, too deep into explanations. Um, but yeah, so with communication policies, if team members have an opportunity to acquire hidden information, such as by speaking to a spectator or leaving a match to use the restroom, um, they are restricted from communicating with their teammates for the duration of the match. Um, in this case, once they leave the table, without a judge's permission or guidance, um, they have create they made themselves spectators. They can return. They can sit down with their teammates. They cannot speak. They cannot offer any sort of possible assistance to the match. You don't have to like kick them out of the venue. It's not like they have to be you know away from their friends for forever. But as soon as they start talking about match results, gone. Um, and in this case, Newmont and Nivazette, since they did talk about mat the match, will receive match losses, which will be assessed at the beginning of the next match. Which is so exciting for their team, because their team just loses that next round. Um, since Neheb didn't ask for anything, um, didn't ask for the assistance, necessarily, we're going to assume not, uh, he doesn't receive a match loss, so he actually must continue playing this game to determine the win. <clears throat> so even though Newmont and Nivazette both receive match losses, um, those will be applied next round, since their matches are already over. At an SCG Open, after drawing opening hands in match one, game one, Arvod calls for a judge. He noticed that when he borrowed some cards from a friend in the morning, he thought he put them in the same sleeve as his deck, but actually used the wrong sleeves. Um, the player tells you that the cards he borrowed from his friend are four cabinet souls in a horizon canopy. You check the deck, the cards in different sleeves are four cavern of souls and a horizon canopy. I feel like I have to abstain because I was there. Yes! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, me, and David were. <laughs> yep. So, Shane. You already talked to me about this. Did I? You did. Brandon. Well, I did. uh. <laughs> do 
just trying to obviously mark uh, he's already put into a deck at this point. Sure. This is after drawing all these games. So. Holly, would you care to check? Uh, I agree with the marked cards. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I'm, have they has they have they played at all, or is it he drew his cards much? Drew oh, opening no. hand and was like, as he was drawing them off the top, he went, ah, crap. Mm -hmm. So they haven't actually begun the game. They have not begun the game. Hmm. Well, they've drawn opening hands, but they haven't played the game. Right. So it was, it was caught during, I guess. Free green procedure. Free green procedure. Thank yep. you. I'm like, I know the word. It's there. Yep. Um. So I would think since it was caught before magic actually was played, he'd be allowed to fix it with a warning. Okay. Brandon, <clears throat> any ideas? Uh, I'll second that stuff. Okay. Good morning. What? I was giving you your five minutes. Oh, okay. Got it. So, um. How would you feel if those were the sleeves in question? But the same scenario works. Same scenario. Yep. Except your opponent might notice the differential in color as opposed to the white border on the previous sleeve when you're shuffling. I, I was going to say, those have completely different... Right, but in, in shuffling and I'm looking at the side of your deck, they oh, might sure. look the same because mm -hmm. they both have a white border on the end. Where this has got... A, completely different color variation to it that, sure. that your opponent should probably see as you're shuffling, or maybe you might even should be seeing as you're shuffling. It is yeah. only five cards, though, so if it's like dim lighting, I could see where maybe you don't notice it right away. Yeah. So we so, can assume that. <laughs> so David and I actually had this call. Um, and he? And John, yes. Um, so the IPG 3.8 states that cards or sleeves in a player's deck have inconsistencies on them that might allow them to be differentiated from each other while in the library. Could you differentiate between these cards in the library? Probably. Yeah. 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 Probably. Yeah. Could you differentiate between these in the library? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Possibly. Um, and the upgrade path for this is that if the head judge believes in the deck's owner and noticing the pattern would be able to gain substantial advantage from the knowledge, the penalty is a game loss. <coughs> so... When we took this call, um, we talked and we decided that um, this was a case of marked cards and that because of the potential for to gain significant advantage, um, Cavern of Souls obviously can lead to a huge advantage in a deck that runs five colors. Um, and knowing you have that card can make a big difference. Um, we determined that this could be abused, it could be used to our advantage, and should be upgraded to a game, a game loss. Um, we were overturned, or we were, yeah, we were overturned. We in were this. negated, but um, that's that's a conversation for a different. And day. that because the first set of sleeves were so different, that there was no reasonable way that an opponent would not be able to see them. Hmm. Which I don't personally agree with, um, as you can tell by the fact that I was overturned. Mm -hmm. um, but. That's why we have the upgrade path there. Um, if a head judge believes that the deck's owner notices it. I was not the head judge. Um, and so, you know, my ruling there, which it was at an SCG Open, Team Lead had the ability to do so, and that's what David was for me. Um, so we we stayed, said that this was going to be our upgrade and we were overturned. I thought that was fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, in the middle of a match, Anawan receives a phone call from his girlfriend. She had a long day at work and wants to tell him all about it. He looks at his opponent, mouths, I'm sorry, then continues to play while talking on the phone. The opponent confirms that nothing related to MTG was discussed, except for the fact that Anawan told his girlfriend he was at a tournament. Shane. What do you think? I hate, I hate to beg up for this moment, but uh, would it be officiated differently for red sleeves? Oh, yeah, sorry. I totally forgot about that. Um, sorry. Yeah, so I be, I would personally believe that this would also be a case of marked cards, um, just because it's a lot less likely that an opponent could notice that. Um, I can't say what would have been done. I would I would say this is marked cards with a pattern. Um, talking to the players, I did not believe they were cheating. I wouldn't have gone down that road any further, but I would upgrade it. Yes. Yeah. 
even though it's the player called the judge on himself. Even though he called it on himself. Okay. Yeah. So, phone call. This will be the last one. Not all at once now. He called out Shane. Yep. All right. Now the tracking on. Now the tracking MTR. You got it? Yep, so okay. NPR says you may not use any anychronic device for storing or taking notes. Yep. <laughs> Apparently, so, but, he needs to finish up his phone call and hang up. Yep. Is there an infraction? If he does it in a timely manner, probably not. Okay. But if he's continuing the conversation? Yeah. So the important thing there to remember is that with tournament errors, there's not like a GRV equivalent for a tournament error. There's no catch-all that says you broke this rule, um, so we have to penalize you somehow, so I'm going to put it in this category. Tournament errors don't have those. So even though talking on the phone is against the policies stated in Magic, it doesn't fall under CPB, um, and thus doesn't fall under anything else. Um, so Anaron receives no penalty. Um, you should say, hey, this isn't allowed, put the phone away. Should they continue to use that phone, um, they may receive penalties for disobeying the rules of a tournament official. But as such, just talking on the phone is not a case of um, a tournament error. Same with using dice for a life total. It's against the rules, you can't do it. But if we see a player do it, we can't penalize them for it. We can only tell them it's broken. That's CPP. Is it CPP yeah. now? They changed that. Did they? It's okay. now part of the entire status information thing. Remember? Yeah. Yeah, we we need to watch that. Okay. Um, I'll give you two questions. Yes. Let's see what happens. So. <laughs> um, sorry, I didn't get through everything, three, but I hope that was at least a little bit better. Um, oh, well, it's just a Cheeto. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is. It's a Cheeto. Um, That's your so, Cheeto. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hope we learned a little bit about tournament errors. Do we have any questions that we haven't already covered? If he My does continue to talk on the phone, will all three of them get a warning? <laughs> Opponent, him, and girlfriend? Yes. You can DQ her, right? <laughs> After the event. Yeah. 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 She might well, feel well, awkward right. if somebody shows up for a little of blizzard because she's the accuser. <laughs> anyway. So, um... <laughs> Yeah, you, you you can penalize them, uh, give them a warning. I believe that falls under UC minor. Um, yeah, minor. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's minor. minor. It used to be major, but they've moved it. Not listening to a... Uh, yeah. Sort of like not adhering to the instructions of a judge. Okay. Yeah. Something like that. Um, but it's a direct instruction of a judge. Yes. Uh, yeah. The opponent doesn't see that. You fail my announcement, you get a UC minor, that doesn't matter. Um, it means, did mention, though, that yes. you are allowed to take brief personal phone calls with an opponent's permission. Yeah. In this case, the opponent did not give explicit permission, but they didn't say no either. So, so the judge, so I may have missed this. Was the judge called at any point during this, or is this still just a thing? The judge was called, yeah. There's a reason you're at the table. Okay. Um, so yeah, is, is either player wanting to actually pursue any kind of thing? Any of the active players? Yeah, I am. He's on the phone Yeah. There you go. Okay, so so one of the players does actually have a problem with this. Yeah. We'll yeah, we're, we're, we're in a complicated sticky situation. I need to not be on the phone. Mm -hmm. Also, there's time, and you're wasting my time. Yeah. The answer to this is that if both players are actually reasonably okay... I, say, I did state that he continued to play Magic on oh, my phone. Yeah. And then give an extension. And like, necessary. if the opponent had really had an issue with it, like, it's more just... The out is if the opponent does not actually have a problem with it, and person like Min is watching her match and like calls the judge and says, "Judge, she's on the phone," then it's one of those that the players can resolve the situation themselves, yeah. provided they're not like breaking rules or bribing. Yeah. So just to break yeah, the big thing there was that there is no GRB type for tournament errors. Well, you know they have a code system on the phone. She's actually providing advice. Yes. She's actually on a balcony, you know, reading out the opponent's hand. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh, she's that's how her day was going, she, right? She's across the uh, street in a hotel with binoculars. <laughs> That'll be addressed in Next Level Magic 2. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's on the L3 test. So, <laughs> it's on the secret L5 test. Don't worry. So, 
Awesome. Thank you very much, everyone. All right.